Good morning, church. Let's stand together. If you're joining us online, we want you to worship freely. We want you to feel the Spirit of God moving in this place and moving where you are. So worship the King of kings and Lord of lords for all he's done. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing that again. What can wash? And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the blood. of peace. This is all my hope. And this is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow. Oh, precious, and oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. His promises evermore and pour out your thankfulness let it overflow let the redeemed of the Lord say so we want to enter this place with thanksgiving in our heart Led me out of the desert, brought me into his streams, river of living water, and turned my bitter into sweet. And all my burdens are lifted, I took the shackles off my feet, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so sing of his promises evermore and pour out your thankfulness let it overflow let the redeemed of the Lord say so yeah let 
There's joy. There's joy in the morning. Springing up in my soul. There is life worth living. Because he calls me his own. There's a hallelujah. After sweet victory. And there's no sound louder than captive set free. No, there's no sound louder than captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises evermore. Oh, pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. He delivered us. He brought us out of our old life. Let's give him praise for all he's done. Here we go. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer. You are my promised land. You are my deliverer. The freedom I'm living in, oh, you are my deliverer, you are my promised land, oh, you are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in, you are my deliverer, you are my promised land, oh, you are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in, oh, you are my deliverer. So sing of his promises evermore. Oh, and pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, and pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. God's people say amen. There we go. Good morning. We're so glad you joined us with worship. If you're here with us in person, we hope you picked up a bulletin. If you have a prayer request, if you're a guest of ours, we'd like to connect with you. And there's a connect card on the inside you can fill out and drop it in our um, offering plate. Or you can meet the pastor or Brother Jay at the end of the service in this welcome lobby. Um, if you're joining us online, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you've continued to worship with us, and we hope that today's going to be a great day just for God to pour out upon us and for us to pour back blessing and thankfulness to him. Let's continue in worship. Father God, we love you. We thank you that your spirit desires to meet with us and is here. So God, we ask you to just let us feel your presence. As God, we bow down, as we lift our voices, God, as we hear your word, God, we just pray that everything would bring you glory today. You are everything for us. You're our hope in a dark world. God, when we just lay it all out, you're everything we need, and we thank you for it. We continue to worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prosper and when the darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph oh my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing to 
you that mighty name of Jesus, name above all names. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. He can take every situation, turn it for his good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, and you comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Let's sing that again. Strength wait will rise. upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. You are. You are the everlasting God. Lift your voice to Him. The everlasting God. Do not faint. You do not faint. You won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Give the Lord a hand.
God, we praise you for being our defender, for being our strength, for lifting us up and holding us up, taking us to new heights. God, build us up this morning and, and uh, help us to see the victory, whether it's right in front of us or, or in the future. We know it's coming because we know that you hold the victory in your hands and, and you've given it to us. We win. We're on your, your side. God, help us this morning to see from your word uh, what, you, what you want us to, um, to build our lives upon and grow in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. from the fall of pastors. I don't know if you've watched in, in uh, the past decade, but there have been several churches that have experienced incredible damage over the fall of pastors and the lack of integrity that we're seeing a lot of times in the pulpit. Well, the article references a research project completed by a, a, an old friend of mine, the late uh, Howard Hendricks, on 246 pastors that had fallen morally within the same two-year span. And there were four characteristics that Hendricks discovered. The first one, he said, none of the men were involved in any kind of real accountability. We talked that, about that a lot around here, that everyone needs to have some kind of accountability in their life. And I, I was blessed when I moved here uh, to Monroe that one of my old friends that I had served uh, on a staff in Halton, Louisiana, he was a member there. Carl Kaufman, who's a physical therapist here in town, is my accountability partner. And I meet with him every Tuesday for lunch. And man, we talk about life. We talk about our marriage. We talk about our kids. We talk about our jobs. And it's healthy. It's, it's needed in the life of everyone here, but especially when we're talking about pastors. Well, each of the men had all but ceased having a daily time of personal prayer Bible reading and worship. And that's hard for many of us to, to consider that a pastor or a minister, uh, when they have their day to spend time with God, that they wouldn't. But you, you would be surprised by how many really do struggle with keeping their spiritual disciplines in check. Of these 246 uh, pastors that fell, more than 80% of the men became sexually involved with the other woman after spending significant time with her often in counseling situations. And without exception, each of the 246 had been convinced that sort of fall would never happen to them. When I talk to uh, couples going through affairs in their marriages, I said, nobody ever wakes up one day and just says, hey, I think I'm going to have an affair today. Uh, the work of, of the devil just continues in their life and they continue to believe the lie of the devil and they continue to walk down a slippery slope that starts with innocent relationship and then leads to a place of no return. Well, today we begin a new series entitled Every Good Work. And we are looking at the instructions that Paul gave Titus for the establishment of the church on the island of Crete. I was telling the men this morning, I, I like to mix up thematic studies with book studies as we, as we uh, preach through God's Word. And all of the advice is still practical for today. Over this month, we will dive in to see how to select a pastor, how to spot trouble in the church. Uh, so if you need to find out if you're the trouble, come next week. We're going to talk about that. Uh, what sound doctrine is. You've probably heard of sound doctrine, but maybe you're not sure what that really means. Well, we're going to see that in this, this little book to Titus, this letter to him. And then how to be ready for the work that God 
has for you. Uh, we're looking at how our church can be ready for every good work. So today let's talk about the potential pastor. A day will come in the life of this church when we, uh, you will be seeking another pastor. A committee will be formed and there will be what seems like countless resumes to consider. If you've ever been on a pastor search committee or any other kind of minister search committee, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the question is, how can you know that you're on the right track? There's, every resume is going to look the same. They're going to probably be the same seminaries and a lot of the same type of experiences. So what are the intangibles? Well, what about those of you that God will move to other towns? And maybe you're here today and you're a guest with us and, and, and you're trying to find a new church home. Maybe you've come to a new community or just to a place where you feel like your gifts and talents could be used in a different way somewhere else. Well, you will need to look uh, for that new church home and how do you know what to look for in a pastor? You see, a lot of the things we look for today aren't even biblical. Uh, we look for, you know, for a lot of the younger generation, it's, is it hip? Is it current? Does that person have all the things that I don't have, by the way? You know, the skinny jeans, the, the slender body, the tan uh, and hair, all of those things. Uh, we've become very performance driven in the church. And for a lot of people, it's about the worship, the music, the how that particular pastor communicates God's word but there's so many intangibles and I I want to let you know that because there will be a day that will come when you'll be faced with that and you'll have to say listen there is something deeper than what that person does in the platform on Sunday morning you're going to need to know that and that's why Paul was teaching this to Titus you're not just going to go look for the most popular person or the person that seems to be able to preach well or even seems like they can handle stress well Paul laid out for Titus some very clear instructions on what to look for. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9. Will you stand with me if you're physically able? And we welcome those of you joining us online. I hope you'll take your Bibles and join us today as well. He started out this, this letter to him, and he's left Titus on the island of Crete to continue to plant churches. And he says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put uh, what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to a charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to that, uh, to that word, that trustworthy word as taught, as that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Let's pray together. Father, we pray today through the preaching of your word that you'll show us how to be involved in a good work, how to be the type of church that, God, you are pleased with, and go in the direction that you would have us go. Help us to learn from Paul's words to Titus over this month, Lord, how to look around and take an examination of where we are and where we need to be not only as a church, but also in our personal lives as well. And we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. So Paul begins telling him you're going to go into all of these towns. Now, this is important. Remember I've told you most of us read the Bible through the lens of our experience, right? So I need to stop you for a moment and tell you there was no First Baptist Church of Crete. And across the corner, there was no First Methodist Church of Crete. And down the street, you've been to those little towns, right? Where First Methodist, First Baptist, the Catholic Church are all right there downtown. There was nothing like that. I want you to picture that as the church was being planted, it was much more like a Sunday school class or your connect group meeting in someone's home. If that will give you a visual of what was happening, it's what's happening really 
uh, literally around the world and in places where the gospel is taking off. It's taking off in these small group homes where really the gospel is being pressed against by the government of these different countries, even today. So you're looking at a lot of people that are meeting in house churches and while they're meeting in house churches, Paul is going around on his missionary journeys and he's setting up the church with elders over each town. So these elders, the presbyters, all of that can be translated back to pastors, these shepherds, these pastors over really a city of churches. It would not be any different than really if you had a pastor's meeting today in Monroe, West Monroe and all the pastors showed up and started talking about spiritual matters that are going on in their community. So I want you to get that visual because it will help you to understand why Paul was teaching what he was teaching to Titus in the, in the, the entire month as we look at this book together. It is the church beginning to form. And if you're going to look for a, a potential pastor, what, what Paul tells Titus to start with is a family man. You want someone who is a family man. So he's going into these towns and he tells him, listen, in every town that I direct you to, I, I want you to go look for somebody who is committed to their family. And he shares the two main areas where we need to be committed to our family. The first is in marriage and the second is in parenting. So as he's appointing these elders, he says, listen, this person needs to be above reproach. In other words, you, you don't even look at someone who has the potential of a bad reputation. So if, if he's going into these towns and he says, hey, what about Rufus? I've heard about Rufus. And somebody says, man, you don't want to deal with Rufus. Rufus got a lot going on in his personal life. We'll move on. He said, you've got you've to set this up where you can leave. You see, Titus is not going to stay. He's staying behind to just put the, the ends together that Paul has already done on his journey there. And he says, listen, you've got to get leaders in place, and they need to be good enough leaders that you can leave behind. Well, why is family the first thing he talks about? Because I'm going to tell you, the first ministry that anybody in this room has is to your family. Last night, we celebrated with uh, Camille and Wesley in their wedding and uh, I've, I've purposefully changed my wedding, the wedding vows that I do over the past several years to have a lot of the gospel in it. And I really want it to be a church service. And, and the reason for that is, is there are so many marriages, even Christian marriages, that forget that it's all about the gospel. It's all about viewing your husband, your wife, through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ and through the gospel and being able to forgive and to love and to cherish the way that Jesus does with us. Well, he says this person's marriage needs to be committed. He needs to be committed to one woman. He can't be flirtatious with other women. He can't be seen out with other women that are not his wife. He is the husband of one wife. He is a one-woman Man, So that's the first thing he says. But then he goes on and he says, you know how a parent is in the home. Now, obviously, this is in the home. This is not after your kids leave the home. But you know if they're effective because their children are believers. I mean, obviously, you're going to be discipling your kids in the home and says not, not open to the charge of, of being a, a wild person, a, a partier. Not, not being insubordinate, not willing to submit to the authority of the parent. Why is this important? Because a man whose family situation is not right is never going to be able to give the energy that he needs to give to the congregation. Does that make sense? We all know that. Even in your work that you've done over the years and the bumps that you've had in the roads of your marriage and your, your uh, parenting, you look at that and you say, wow, it really does affect every area of life, doesn't it? So he says this person needs to be a family man. Well, Brian Croft, uh, who writes a lot about pastoral ministry, he, he said the most recent figures show that 50% of current pastors will not be in the ministry in five years. He says this number rises to a staggering 80% at the 10-year mark. Pastors, he says, already face a constant barrage of unreasonable and unrealistic expectations on their limited capacity. This alone is often too much to bear over time. But he says, unfortunately, it gets worse. 
Add to this the challenges and expectations a church places on a pastor's family, and these attrition rates should be no surprise. He says 80% of pastors say that ministry has had a negative effect on their families. Now you can think about that. How many of you have ever said or heard somebody say, and that kid's a pastor's kid? Have you ever heard that before? Or, or in your dad, the pastor? I remember one day uh, Josh was uh, at football practice at Washita, and he was a freshman, and he, was, he, he got really angry at a coach yelling at him, and he let a cuss word fly out of his mouth. Now, Josh is not a cusser, and if he's going to watch this day, he's going to say, I cannot believe you told those people I said a cuss word. But he said a cuss word, and his position coach said, isn't your dad, in front of everybody, isn't your dad the pastor down at that Swartz First Baptist Church? Does he know you talk like that? And he told me, he said, Dad, it took everything within me in front of all those guys to not say, you say you're a Christian. Does your family and your God know you talk the way you do? He said it was everything within me. He said, I practiced resolve because I knew some way it would get back to you. You see, it's this, this idea that because someone is an eight-year-old child that happens to be in a minister's family, boy, that changes things. There should be something very different different from them, even from ourselves. And he goes on to say that 66% of church members expect their pastor, his wife, and children to live at a higher moral standard than they do themselves. So more than six out of ten people say, well, hey, you're the one that decided to be a pastor or a pastor's wife or pastor's kids. So, so, yeah, I expect more out of you than I do of myself. And he says, there's where the problem lies. But I, I would agree with what Paul said to Titus and, and also what Brian says here. The potential pastor is a family man, a person that is committed to family first. The potential pastor is also a faithful man. A faithful man. When you look at 7 and 8, Paul tells uh, Titus, as you're, as you're looking at these people and you're looking for somebody who's above reproach, and he says that twice in this passage, somebody who's got a good reputation, that, that it doesn't mean that there's not going to be people that don't like them. Uh, there are going to be people that are not going to like them, but is it because of sin on their part and because of that sin, is it sin that disqualifies them from ministry? Now that's important because of something he's going to say uh, a little bit further down in our text. But in, in verse 7, he says there's five things that this pastor can't be. And then in verse 8, he says, but there are six things that he needs to be. So let's look at those together. The five things that a pastor is not to be is arrogant, thinking more of himself than he ought to, quick-tempered, or a drunkard, violent, or greedy. So when you're thinking about who that pastor is, he says, go, go out and, and find out, because there's no seminaries, there's no colleges for ministry schools. He's going into these towns, and he's really looking for somebody who's truly pursuing Christ. And he says, look, he, he needs to love his family but he also needs to be faithful. He needs to be somebody who's, who's showing that he's moving away from a sinful lifestyle and moving towards Christ. And, and it says here there's things that he needs to be able to do. And these six things in, in verse 8 are be hospitable, be a lover of good, be self-controlled, be upright, holy, and disciplined. I remember uh, one time I was doing a wedding, and it was uh, in a different denomination. And that dom denomination has a different view. Let's just say they have a different view on alcohol than Southern Baptists have traditionally had on alcohol. And uh, I'll never forget this. I was brand new in the ministry, and it was a friend's wedding, and, and I was coming to this denomination, and the pastor there really didn't want me to come because I was not of their denomination but I was her best friend so uh, and her family had a lot of influence in the church which typically means they give a lot of money in that particular denomination so I was allowed to come but we're sitting at this uh, banquet table I'll never forget this as long as I live he's at the other end of the table 
So he's down here, I'm down here with Sharon. And Sharon and I, I mean, we are, we are newly married, newly married. And um, they, they start passing out the wine, and I go, oh boy, here we go. And, and they pass out wine to us, and, uh, and I just said, I, I won't be needing any, but thank you. And uh, Sharon said, is that the right thing to do? I mean, even if you don't drink, should, should we... Should we at least raise our glass so nobody feels uncomfortable? I said, I, I don't know, but I can't. I'm not going to. So I, I just didn't, you know, and I'm not judgmental of people that are. But you just need to know. I was a young pastor in a really tough situation with all eyes on me and people that have known me for years. And uh, this other pastor looks down and sees that I didn't. And he says, well, since my brother at the other end of the table is not going to do a toast. I'll do three. And he goes into his little barrage. And, and can I just tell you, he was already a little buzzed, okay? He, he was already having a really, really good time. And he got through with his, his uh, toast. And he says, And I say these things in the name of the Father. Good, 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 good. And he went and poured another glass. And in the name of the Son, good, 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 good. And we can't forget that spirit. Three large glasses of wine, and he staggered back to his chair. And I thought, wow, now I see what Paul was saying to Titus. It's not the issue of alcohol, it's the issue of drunkenness. And what I tell people all the time is, how do you know, how do you know where the line is for you? How do you know? And people always look at me, especially college students, how do you know where the line is for you? Well, it's about nine beers. Well, how do you know? Because I've done it before. Because I've done it before. And, and when you're talking about Anybody that's in ministry, man, you start allowing yourself to have things put into your body. I, I was telling my, my uh, pain doctor when I was dealing with my, my pain that, I, that I've dealt with, I said, I want to do everything I can within our medical power to not get me in a situation where I have to take something that could be addictive. Now, some people have to, but I said, in the role I'm in, I already have a fuzzy brain, all right? So in the role I'm in, I really need to be able to be sharp. Why? Because I'm supposed to be disciplined. And because of that, I say, I don't know if I can always be that way, but I want to be that way. Why? Because it's so easy at any point in the day, somebody calls you and, and you have people that will ask you some interesting things as a pastor, and it's easy if you're not sharp to say something that you would later regret, right? So I think that's why Paul is saying, listen, you've got to set it up with people who don't have a hot temper. How many of you, how many of you have people that you have said, you know, if I wasn't a Christian, I would just pop them in the mouth. Nobody's going to raise their hand on that one. Okay, there's two, two takers in the middle, right? Absolutely. So he says, you know, you want to, but you don't. And why? Because of our witness. So imagine being a pastor that's hot-tempered. I was reading in the, in the paper, and there was, uh, this is back in Alabama, and there's this little town of Cottonwood, and there's some tough folks down there. And I kid you not, there was a business meeting that a fight broke out. This has been just about 10 years ago. And the front page of the paper says, Pastor Beaten by Deacon. And the pastor went out in the parking lot, and a deacon followed him with a two-by-four and beat him half to death. He was so mad at him. Quick-tempered. And I thought, my goodness, the things that we can allow to get us out of control. Well, William Perkins said, He who would be a faithful minister of the gospel must deny the pride of his heart, be emptied, of ambition and set himself wholly to seek the glory of God in his calling. Boy, that's a strong, strong statement. The po potential pastor is a family man, a faithful man, 
And it goes on to say that the potential pastor is a firm man. And this is where today a lot of pastors have a struggle. And I think a lot of it's because of our, our uh, age of information. I think it's because er everything's readily available. I, I, feel, I feel that it's really what's difficult for small churches today. A lot of our small churches are, are declining and dying. And I think it's because there was a day when if you wanted to, to hear a pastor from another church, you had to actually be at home and uh, watch it on TV. But because of the internet, you can watch and listen to any kind of pastor, any kind of worship style, anywhere around the world at, the, at just the push of a button. And I think for a lot of places, that's become a hindrance because people, people uh, allow themselves to get out there and they're just seeing what they're seeing. They're just hearing what they're hearing, but they're not a part of that congregation. They don't know the man. They don't know the situation. But they begin, like all of us do, to compare what's happening on the Internet with what's happening in their, in their church. And because of that, a, a lot of the leadership issues have become harder, especially in our uh, smaller congregations across the country. Well, Paul tells Titus that this man needs to hold firm to the word. And, and when this pastor holds firm to the word, it, it allows him, it causes two things. He says to give instruction in sound doctrine. If he holds to the word, if he sticks to scripture, even when it's not popular, he will be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, sound belief. And we'll talk about that more in a couple weeks. But also, okay, here's where the problem comes. I wish Paul hadn't written this to Titus. But also rebuke those who contradict it. So he's called not only to hold to the word, but also to correct those that are not according to the word and, and that's a very difficult task to be firm because it's not popular to be firm and there's times that that man has to be firm when it it really affects other people's lives and he doesn't have the freedom to really explain himself as to why he does it outside of what he knows from the word and what he has talked about with that individual in the word but we live in a day where people think everything needs to be disclosed. But out of protection for people, a lot of times these pastors really struggle in trying to protect people. It causes problems within the church. Well, William Baxter said of pastors, Take heed to yourselves, lest your example contradict your calling. Lest your, you unsay with your lives what you say with your tongues and be the greatest hinderers of the success of your own labors. All of us have seen, especially those of us in this room that love the church, all of us have seen the incredible damage that can happen when a pastor falls into sin. And even, even really recently, over at a church in Texas close to where I grew up I, I saw that a church that was thriving doing great things and then as the onion peeled back the church has had a hard time being able to even respond to what has happened because a pastor fell well that leads us to a question what can you do to support your pastor's family and I'd say the same thing of your ministers here on staff I think that, that our church, you know, I was talking to a couple of our men this morning. I think our church does a good job with this. I think our church is, is good about um, giving time for people to spend with their marriages, uh, giving time for, for people to spend with their families. I, I see that greatly here at this church. But I think the best thing that you can do is pray. Boy, pray. Spiritual warfare is hard for you. Imagine what it is for the person who's trying to help you. Boy, they need prayer. They need prayer more than anything else. Uh, positivity. People need positivity that are seeking to be your pastor and, and uh, minister. Uh, there's people that constantly, I know there's uh, one particular connect group constantly sends me encouraging 
notes. I have a man in our church that's been homebound since before COVID, and, and he has the gift of encouragement. And it, he just knows at just the right time, a card comes in the mail. You don't know the difference that makes uh, for people. But I would also say to you, bless their kids. And I, I love hearing about, especially with smaller kids, some of the things that some of you are doing with, with our, our ministers' families and taking kids and doing things with them and inviting them into your life. That is huge. That is huge. Especially when you have uh, ministers that come from a different place because this is not their home. So anything that you can do to make it their home is a blessing. You want a family man. Well, what is most important trait to you in a pastor? When you look at verses uh, 7 and 8 and you see what he's not to do and what he is to do, a lot of what you form as your opinion to be the greatest trait is because of past hurt in your life. And it's important that you look for faithfulness. Not perfection, but faithfulness in that person. And then the third is, are you willing to follow the oversight of a pastor? Boy, that's hard. It requires trust. And it requires trusting in someone who is not perfect. Only Jesus is. But man, when Paul told Titus to look for somebody who would stand on the word and be willing to correct, even when it's not popular, that is hard to do. Very few people want to do that anymore. In fact, that's why in this culture, many people are leaving the pastorate. You want a firm man. So while this passage is essentially about appointing pastors, and you say, ah, well, this hasn't really applied to me today. Yes, it does. And I think there's a lot of things. We talked about it as men in the prayer time this morning. I said, I think there's a lot of times we skip over things in the Word because we don't want to really address them. And then when the the issue arises, we don't know how to deal with it. But even though this is about appointing pastors today, it applies to all of us, doesn't it? God wants all of us to be committed to our families first. It's our first and greatest ministry. And it's important for us to remember that more important than anything you do at this church is what you do with your family. Because what you do with your family either qualifies or disqualifies us. So when we, we look at this passage, God wants us all to be faithful. And he wants us all to be firm in our commitment to him. So there is not a pastor alive who always gets it right. And neither does anyone else in this room. That's why every good work always begins with the gospel. Every good work begins with the gospel. In Romans 6.23 it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some of you may be looking at this passage and be saying to yourself, thank you Jesus that you didn't call me to be a pastor or a minister. But if it's in the Bible, why don't we just do it? Why don't we just raise the standard for all of our lives and say, man, I want to be that person. But, but here's where we have to caution ourselves. I remember going through faith evangelism and being taught, and, uh, and I remember I was on staff with a guy um, who was uh, seminary trained, had just come into the ministry. We were both brand new in ministry, and we went through faith training, and he was radically saved. And I was like, what? Raised by a pastor? Went to college and then to seminary? And then comes to evangelism training and the Holy Spirit radically saved him. And he was baptized as a staff member on the church. And I was like, how does that even work? I mean, do, does he have to, does anything change for him? I mean, does he have to, and that's what he was wondering. Do, does this mean I have to resign? And it's like, well, no, you're far better now because you're saved. You've got the Holy Spirit in your life. But we've seen that before where pastors or ministers needed to be saved. You know, I meet a lot of people that want to serve the Lord, but they're not saved. So what happens is they go to work in the church. Hello? And while they're working in the church, it becomes a burden for them and it becomes difficult because they're trying to outwork something in their life that Jesus has already done in saving them. So maybe you're here today and you say, wow, I, I want to be a family person. I want to be faithful and I want to be firm. 
I, I want to tell you, it doesn't happen by you just doing more, getting better. It can only happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through receiving that free gift of eternal life in Him. Because there's going to be days we're going to get it wrong, right? There's been days in the last six and a half years as your pastor, I have gotten it wrong. And I'm not afraid to say that. I have made some decisions, as all of us have, that we wish we could have back. Amen? But thanks be to God that we have his forgiveness and his grace, and it's here for you today. Father, we do pray that our lives would line up with this scripture. We know that Paul gave it to Titus to go look for people who could be leaders in the church. But Lord, why would we settle for anything less in our own lives? So, Lord, for Christians here today, I pray that we would be committed to our families and be committed to faithfulness, to serving you every day, to take the caution that happened in these men that failed. God help them. The men that, that just got led astray by sin. Lord, help us to be more accountable. Help us to not forget that it's the more saturated we are with your presence, the less we are inclined to be entertained by the world. So, Lord, I pray for my Christian brothers and sisters that we would all be firm in our commitment to you. But I also pray for the one that's here today that's maybe overwhelmed by, by the thought of, of giving up being uh, disciplined and, and all of these different lists of things that you want them to do to be able to have sound doctrine in their life and to be a person of your word and I just pray for them that, Lord, you would say, it's already been done. Everything that you need has been completed in Christ on the cross. So maybe for you it is to understand that the wages of your sin is death, but you don't have to stay there. You can be born again today and have eternal life through Christ Jesus becoming your Lord. So I just, I pray for you if you're in this room or online, Holy Spirit, come and help us to see how we need to respond to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me? Now let's sing together. And if you have any decision upon your heart, ministers are here at the front to respond to you.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God, you do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, you comfort those. You lift us up on wings like eagles. We have a special guest with us today. This is uh, Tracy's going to come in just a minute. And she is, um, she helps with Operation Christmas Child. And I don't know, Tracy, what your um, title is. I'm going to say you're, you're the head over everything. But anyway, she, she works in this area in Monroe, helping with that ministry. And she's going to come up and talk about that. But let me make a few quick announcements. First of all, um, thank you all for praying for me and my family. My dad passed away on Saturday morning. The Lord took him home. He had Alzheimer's. And the Lord was gracious, and he is celebrating in heaven. It happened at about 125 on Saturday morning, and we are grateful to our Lord. And we're going to have a celebration service for him at Farmable Baptist Church on Friday at 11. If anybody knows Dad, and if you want to come and you want to see my mom and encourage her, you're welcome to do that. Um, Dad had donated his body to science, so it will be more of a memorial service. So he's um, already in another place at this time uh, the fall community carnival is going on on the 31st so don't forget about that the pastor has asked last last week's message was who's your one who are you working on who's God laid on your heart so begin thinking about that and remember on that Sunday on the 31st is what roundup Sunday you remember that everybody gets to wear all their western duds their western clothes and we're going to have a fun time with that so don't forget about all that so be praying about that but uh, Tracy if you would come on up and I'm going to let her talk a little bit about Operation Christmas Child and Tr Tracy we got this mic on for you in case you Tracy Hunter, and I am a representative of Operation Christmas Child. I'm a yeah, it's on. I'm a year-round volunteer, which means um, I don't get paid, but I get paid heavenly rewards because I love talking about Jesus and I love talking about Operation Christmas Child. And y'all rec recognize that it's from Samaritan's Purse. We're a branch of Samaritan's Purse. And I know y'all have seen these boxes before, right? Because Miss Helen is really, really good about Operation Christmas Child. She's been doing a lot longer than I have. And um, I just want to encourage y'all. This is not just a box full of toys and, and hygiene items and school supplies and things. But this is what we call a go box. It's a gospel opportunity box. You know, you, you may have always wanted to go uh, on a mission trip, a foreign mission trip somewhere and you can't now because of COVID or health reasons or whatever, but guess what? You can be a missionary by filling this box because when a child receives this box, they also get a booklet that's called um, Part of the Greatest Journey, and it tells them a little bit about Jesus and who he is. And then they get to go through another book called The Greatest Journey, and they learn more and more about the gospel. And then they get an opportunity um, to accept Christ. Their families can come and listen to these as well. And so many family members have come to Christ because you packed a box. You sent an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And families are interested in what um, Samaritan's Purse has to say with, about Jesus and with the greatest journey because you cared enough to send a gift to their child. They don't know who you are. They don't even know what country that you come from. But they are certainly grateful that somebody loved their child enough to A, send them a gift, some of which children have never gotten a gift before, and you know, B, because you, you, you cared enough 
to tell them about Jesus. And so last year, 2020, COVID, you know, we sent 9.1 million boxes to children all over the world. That was pretty good with COVID. This year, we have an even greater goal, and everybody can pack a box. And if you don't want to get out and pick up things out in the community, you know, because of COVID or because of health reasons or whatever, you can go online, you can go to Operation uh, Samaritan's Purse and click on the Operation Christmas Child button, and you can pack a box online. They have items that, you, that they have, and you can choose what you want to go in your box. You pay your $9 for shipping for each box, and you don't have to go anywhere. So there's all kinds of ways to do this, but I'd like to encourage y'all to pack a go box, a gospel opportunity box. And when you're packing this one, pack one more. One more, which just gives them one more child an ability to hear about Jesus and to hear about your love from somewhere else, and you love them because Jesus loved you. So when it's time for Miss Helen to start um, putting it all out there, yeah. Pack your, par pack your party. Pa start buying stuff now, guys, okay? Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and there's boxes around. You've seen them in your Sunday school classrooms, in your connect rooms. There's boxes. This week is school supplies. So if you've been kind of going by the, the green chart on the wall in your, in your connect group. So school supplies are what we're collecting this month. And uh, if you want to just get a box on your own, there's boxes that are available. You could do something on your own. But the packing party is November the 7th. So that'll be the time we all get together and do that. So thank you, Tracy, for that. Thank you, church family, for what you're going to do. I didn't know you could do that online and shop and do that without even having to get out of your home. No excuse, right? No excuse not to have a box packed for a little kid that needs to hear about Jesus. Let me pray for us, and we will head out of here. First of all, let me say this first. If you're a guest visiting with us, we're so glad that you came to worship with us today. Um, if you would, fill out a card for us. It's on, you can fill it out. It's, in, it's on your, uh, your worship folder, or there's a QR code. You could scan that so we'd have a record of your visit. We could contact you. Church family, if you need prayers for anything, if you would fill out a card and, and put your prayer request on there, we pray for those on Monday mornings. And we'll be praying for you. Let me pray and we'll head out. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity that we have just to grow and learn more about you. Each Sunday when we come uh, in for, for worship, when we go to our connect groups, thank you for um, the opportunity that we have to do missions through Operation Christmas Child. I pray you'll lay, lay that opportunity on our heart and we will follow through with it. Again, we are grateful for your blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.